Mr. Millennium 7 has recently experienced a malfunction of the type human experience. Therefore, I am taking control of the channel to fill the many gaps left by M7 in discussing ESA radars. In fact, due to his very human attitude toward technology, he failed to mention the several issues that plagued ESA radars. Otis, I'm still here. So a few weeks ago there was a video about AESA radars that was inspired by the news that the F-35 is getting a new radar. The key point? Well, AESA technology has made anything else obsolete with PISA or hybrid solutions between the two barely adequate, at least for combat applications. But not everything is warm and fuzzy, the technology may not have reached its maturity yet. And since everyone is actually telling you how cool AESA radars are, including myself, maybe it's time to point out some of the problems. So today we are on a journey to understand the drawbacks and the don'ts of AESA technology, and some of the stuff is hardly covered on YouTube. So, what is an AESA radar? It is a radar then, rather than having a single antenna with a single emitter and a single receiver, it has a lot of transmitter-receiver modules. So the antenna is made of several small elements and each small antenna has a smallish transmitter-receiver module just behind it. These modules are mostly digitally driven by the radar and even the signal is often digitized for signal processing. This solution has several advantages in terms of sensitivity, gain, signal-to-noise ratio and, crucially, for military applications, versatility. You can do things with an AESA radar that you can't do with a conventional radar. And not only radar -y things, but also other stuff like communication, jamming or passive listening. As we said before, pretty much everything else is obsolete when it comes to radars that have to be used in combat. Sometimes these radars are not even called radars anymore, they are called multifunction arrays exactly because they can be used for several different purposes. But is there a price that we have to pay for all these capabilities? Well, an obvious one is complexity and cost. An AESA radar is an order of magnitude more complex than a conventional radar. With complexity comes design and development time, and hence costs. AESA would not be possible without technologies like gallium arsenide integrated circuits or the more modern gallium nitride. And the cost of these technologies is high, they required decades to be developed. They require non-standard production processes and all these costs compound together. Another rather obvious point is that so many active components all tightly packed together just behind the antenna while well, they produce a lot of heat. An AES array is quite thick, dense and compact. And this means that cooling, yeah, it's a real problem. And the problem is made even worse by the fact that an AESA radar requires quite a lot of processing power, which means more electronics, more heat. So AESA radars generally require liquid cooling, which requires a cooling system, radiators, pumps and so on, which adds complexity, adds cost, and crucially, for an aircraft, it adds weight. Gallium nitride, which is still a relatively new technology, is more energy efficient, so it may reduce this problem, but is still very present. To make an AESA radar work, you need processing power. 
a lot of processing power. This is the price that you have to pay for the versatility that we have mentioned above. The hardware and the software that we have today are not yet capable of doing everything we would want, at least for what is in the public domain. In general, we would like doing as much as we can in the digital domain. In this way, a lot of things are actually simplified. And for example, upgrading the radar can be done simply by upgrading the software rather than doing any physical intervention. This is a big advantage in the overall economy of maintaining and operating an Air Force. But with digital comes the limitation of processing power. Our current digital architectures and clock speeds may not be and in general are not fast enough. So during the design process may emerge the necessity of using analog components whose speed is basically limited only by the laws of physics. And the obvious drawback is that every time we use anything analog, we have frozen the radar performance and any and any eventual upgrade may only happen with a physical intervention on the system. And as I said, as far as we know, all the AESA radars in service today do contain some analog component. In an ideal AESA radar, the only analog component should be the TR module. An ideal TR module should contain a waveform generation, a digital to analog converter, a power amplifier and the antenna. This is the transmission chain. The receiving chain should contain an amplifier, an analog to digital converter, and the digitized signal should be sent downstream for processing. And each model would be digitally controlled by a central processor. However, this requires very high speed components and they may either be too expensive for that specific application or we may just don't have a suitable technology. And the problem gets worse with frequency. From what I could gather, radars that operate at lower frequency like ground surveillance or even AWACS radars operating in L-band, S-band or in C-band can get away with an entirely digital AISA radars, but the radars for the fighters that are typically operating in the higher X-band, if not in the Q-band, don't. So we may expect that these fighter radars will contain some analog components. Typically, the beam forming part that is the components that govern the steering of the beams could be analog. Or we can have shortcuts, in that is, the TR modules are managed in groups, sometimes called channels, and each channel is controlled digitally as a single unit. And every channel has a single digital to analog and analog to digital converter. Hybrid solutions like this, for example, are typical of naval radars. Another typical drawback is the scan loss. This is the loss that happens because the beam is moving through the target. A radar normally sends more than one pulse toward the target and the received signal is actually summed to increase the gain. If the beam is moving, not all the received signal will be the same. Because when the target is slightly off axis, the intensity of the received signal will be lower. All radars suffer from this scan loss. If an AESA radar actually uses the beam in this way, moving it continuously, it suffers from scan loss too. However, AESA radars have an additional problem. Because of geometric reasons and interference between the modules, the maximum deflection of the beam in an AESA antenna is around 60 degrees. However, in an AESA radar, the sensitivity of the antenna declines quite quickly with the deflection. As a rule of thumb, with a deflection of 45 degrees, the sensitivity advantage of an AESA ray has already gone. And this is one of the reasons why you see AESA rays proliferate on aircraft, like for example of the on the Suhoi 57, or you see AESA rays mounted on repositioners 
like on the Gripen. And it's quite obvious that a mechanically scanned antenna doesn't have this issue at all. So, do you see the point here? AISA readers have plenty of advantages, but they also have some relatively important disadvantages. And I guess the final question is, well, is actually AISA worth it? And, well, the answer, judging from the diffusion, is actually a resounding yes. However, I thought that since nobody tells you which are the problems, I could do that. But since the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, to learn about the advantages, please watch the video that is appearing beside me. And there's also plenty of other interesting stuff on the channel. So, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.